of you think you're going to eat fish for lunch today? Show of hands, okay. Um, how many of you normally eat fish, let's say, three or four times a week? Um, yeah, that's a few healthy people. Uh, yeah, I grew up in semi-arid India, Deccan Plateau, and we ate a lot of fish while I was growing up. And, and my grandmother made the best fish curry ever. But as years passed, fish became more and more pricey. And in that part of the world today, you have to be really rich to eat fish regularly. Even the so-called middle class can only afford to eat occasionally. Coming from an agricultural family, I decided to pursue agricultural economics for my higher studies. And for my PhD, my thesis was around estimating returns to investments in agricultural research and extension in post-Green Revolution India. Very impressive returns, and understandably so. But it was only when I started working and began to understand the very complex rural realities in India and beyond, I realized how agricultural science and technology bypassed millions of poor rural farming families, and particularly women. That's where my journey with agricultural research for development began, and my quest to understand how best to harness science to improve lives of these poor rural families. And this journey brought me to the fish world. I met Rahima in Bangladesh a few years ago. She was 24 at that time, had two sons. Her husband was a day laborer, so his income was really small, seasonal, and very uncertain. Yeah? Borishal district, where Rahima comes from, is actually amongst the most disaster-prone in Bangladesh. They are battered every year by flooding, cyclones, and tidal surges. The family went hungry on many days. They had a very little piece of land, maybe you wouldn't even call it a homestead, and there was a tiny ditch on that piece of land. And every time there was a flood, fish washed into that ditch, and that was the fish that family ate. They liked eating fish, like all Bangladeshis do. In fact, the saying goes, it is rice and fish that make a Bangladeshi. But these families couldn't really afford any more than that. And in 2013, Rahima came across a project which was training men and women farmers in fish culture. Rahima attended the training. That sounds very simple and straightforward, right, when I say that? The training was being organized, and Rahima attended it. It wasn't that straightforward for Rahima, or women like her in that village or surrounding areas. She was living in a household, a society, with very deeply entrenched social and cultural norms about what women could do or not do. Women did not fish. Women did not farm fish. Women did not go to markets to buy or sell anything. Women did not move around or travel without being accompanied by a male household member or the mother-in-law. They didn't interact with males outside of their household. They didn't own land. They didn't need education because they just had to take care of their household and the children. Yeah. And men made all the decisions in the household and outside. It was an uphill task for Rahima. Eventually, the husband agreed, and she did attend the training. Of course, he joined her in the beginning just to see what was going on. After the training, Rahima realized the opportunity and converted that little ditch on their piece of land into a pond and stocked it with various species of fish. 
she planted vegetables on the dikes of the pond. So they started eating fish, and they consumed three times more than they used to. They started eating vegetables regularly, and slowly she started selling some fish. Yeah? And that helped the family cope with emergencies and lean periods better. I have seen several women in Bangladesh get into fish farming in the last few years. And these are really small scale. They operate on their homesteads and with really small ponds, mainly because they have no access to land. Yeah? And um, when we are talking about small scale ponds, you're talking about, on an average, one hundredth of an acre. Imagine a football field. That's one hundredth the size of that football field. So it's really small. So these women wanted to increase, maximize the production from those ponds so they could consume more fish or sell or do both. So they were looking for fish strains that grew faster and produced more. So these women started using an improved strain of tilapia, which grew 70 to 80% faster than other fish. It was also hardy. It, it could survive in, in a range of situations. It's actually called aquatic chicken by some people because of you know, the low maintenance and, and ease of handling that's involved. Um, and the most important thing from a smallholder perspective is that it is a neutral technology. Irrespective of the scale of operation or the level of inputs that are used, the returns are same. So that was really important for small farmers like Rahima, mainly because they faced significant challenges in accessing resources for their fish production. Several women yeah, got into this uh, fish production, and using these improved strains, together with good management practices, they started improving their incomes manyfold. And some women who were quite entrepreneurial started expanding their enterprise. They took microloans, some borrowed money from their relatives, some convinced their husbands to part with some of their income or savings, and started leasing more land or ponds and, and expanding their production. And the interesting thing is these women are always looking for new opportunities to improve their production. And women becoming entrepreneurs, particularly in fish farming, was unheard of in Bangladesh. I mean, this was a significant break in tradition. It was indeed a man's world. Yeah? And interestingly, these women, a lot of them now, are demonstration farmers. You know, they engage in participatory research to explore options to improve their productivity further. They interact with input suppliers, market agents. They are well respected in their communities and make decisions at home regarding most affairs, including um, financial. They are investing in their children's education, both boys and girls. Um, and these women say they experience a level of independence, confidence, and self-esteem that they didn't experience before. And what are women like these looking for in fish? Yeah? They're looking for fish species or strains that need less feed, less water, less labor. They want fish that are resistant to diseases, fish that are tolerant to variable levels of salinity, temperatures, water quality, and they're looking for fish that are most nutritious. So investing in development and promoting adoption of strains of fish with the kind of traits 
these smallholder farmers, particularly women, are looking for can help increase fish production and make a dent in hunger, malnutrition, and poverty. Several countries, I mean, a few countries uh, like Egypt and Bangladesh have made significant increases in aquaculture production using improved strains of tilapia. But currently, it's only 10% of aquaculture that uses improved strains. So there's a huge opportunity waiting there to be tapped that could benefit millions of smallholder fish farmers, men and women, both in Asia and Africa. And women can play a key role in driving this agenda. And I believe they are ready to take that on. I'll leave you with a thought. And you've heard this before. Give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach a woman to farm fish, and you feed a family for a lifetime, or maybe even beyond. Thank you.